Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Miglieri. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about the electric Corvette, which soon to be here. Audi and Porsche are going to join Formula One. That's going to be awesome, I think. Uh, we'll talk about the new Kia Soul. Kind of cool looking Land Rover 30th Anniversary Edition with white steel wheels. Shake up at Aston Martin in the CEO's chair. We're going to break down a couple of cars we've been driving. The Maserati Levante Trofeo and the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Uh, Zach Palmer, our road test editor, is going to talk about uh, both of those because he's driven both of those. We're going to try a new feature called Dispatches with senior editor for all things green, John Snyder. He's going to give us uh, some of his impressions from the Ford F-150 Lightning launch. Uh, I think he's down in Texas, actually. So we're going to see what that's all about. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we think it's pretty cool. Uh, and finally, we will spend your money. We have a mailbag feature. All right. Let's uh, get right into it. Zach, uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. We have a pretty packed show. I'm, I'm excited to get to it. <laughs> packed show. Uh, we've been talking about uh, this for years, for years. An electric Corvette. A uh, couple of different things here to sort of peel back the onion. It's going to be a plug-in hybrid first. Then we'll get an all-electric model uh, following that. And the plug-in is going to be all-wheel drive. So... This kind of came out of nowhere, frankly. It almost was like like Mark Royce, who's the president of North America for General Motors, just kind of shared a LinkedIn post. And it kind of caught the car world very flat-footed. And then it was just out there. So, I mean, to me, this is super exciting. Uh, we don't know a ton about this. Not a lot of like specs or anything of that nature. But, I mean, to me, you know, and I'll throw it over to you here, but I just... This is like, in the last few years, a mid-engine Corvette, and now we're talking about an electrified Corvette. It's everything people have been talking about for like 15 years. Boom, it's here. So I'm pretty psyched, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And that, that whole mystery of, you know, we don't really know a whole lot about it right now is that Chevy just sort of like shoved this on us. And they're like, yeah, there's, there's going to be a hybrid C8. Uh, and... They didn't say if it's going to be like a grand sport sort of thing. They didn't say if it's going to be like a full-on flagship, a thousand horsepower, uh, crazy thing that is even above the Z06. Uh, they just said there's there's going to be a hybrid. And there's, there's a video of one with uh, power being sent to the front wheels, which, I mean, obviously that has never happened in a Corvette. So it's pretty mind-blowing to even see that video, uh, to see the reality of that. And then also, like you said, the fully electric one, which I have even more questions about. Honestly, I've, I've seen the rumors about them possibly making an electric Corvette crossover, uh, which is a whole other bag of worms to get into, I suppose. I mean, it's I know that we've, we've talked about the possibility of some like Corvette uh, brand offshoot and that this could possibly work for. But uh, yeah, it's. It's some interesting times going down there in the Corvette world, I'd, I'd have to say. It's interesting, too, because I don't think the idea, the notion of a Corvette crossover is blasphemous anymore. You know, we've got the mm -hmm. Ferrari Purisang coming. I think I said that right. Um, pretty soon. Ferrari already did the FF, which was the beauty of that is they sort of had the stance in a car like stance, if you will. But it, it was a hatchback. It had, I think they called it four-wheel drive, but it was really all-wheel drive. I mean, Ferrari's already done that. We're going to talk about the Maserati uh, Levante in a little bit here. Lambo has the Urus. Like, I'd be okay with it. I, to me, I don't necessarily think we need to have these sort of sacrosanct boundaries in 2022 anymore. You know, I, I, I think yeah. it could actually work for them. And it's, it's sort of following in the footsteps of the Ford Mustang, the Mustang mm -hmm. Mach-E already going as an electric crossover. I think we've already seen some pretty good evidence as far as sales and demand for that, that uh, people want something like that, a crossover with real performance, with a really great design and really great name recognition too, which is probably what would sell it right there. You know, have something yeah. super sporty that people know and understand. So, yeah. I think what would help General Motors and Chevrolet is the fact that Corvette is uh, transcendent. I don't think Camaro currently is. I feel like that nameplate has been almost weakened a little bit. Um, 
nothing really wrong with the car. Well, a few things wrong with the car, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> it's still for what it is. It is fine. You know, like I don't know anybody who has driven a Camaro recently and been like, oh, this thing sucked. It's more like, you know, there's some compromises with the visibility, the interior, like bits, things like that. Things that, frankly, cars like the Challenger get away with just because they're a little more like drivable and there's more different things you could get on them, whereas the Camaro has sort of morphed into the really like sharpest end of the spear, the, yeah, the spear, if you will, uh, the sharpest tip of the spear, you know, in the pony car segment, you know, and the Mustang has gotten more, um, you could get a, you know, a Shelby or, you know, whatever you want there, but you can also get an EcoBoost. So that one, like to me, the Mustang has sort of evolved in a better way, I guess, to bring this all together. Uh, and Corvette has certainly evolved over the last few years. And yeah, I mean, I, I actually, as I think aloud, I did a piece on this a few years ago about how a Corvette SUV and a Corvette spinoff, if Chevy or General Motors were to do that, could actually work. I, I think this, like, I think there's something here. And yeah. I think Corvette design has been awesome for the last two generations. Um so I think they have a lot of like mojo there to try to like create some different like electrified variants and even a crossover variant. Yeah. And you know what? If it ends up being a two-door sports car, I don't think I would complain that much about that either. Uh, we, uh, we certainly have plenty of those super, super high horsepower EVs on the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, to have probably, you know, one of the most affordable versions of those, you know, there are. You have things like the Pininfarina Batista, Lotus Amira. Those are all going to be in the like many hundreds of thousands, if not million plus range. Uh, a, a Corvette electric hypercar, on the other hand, maybe that's a couple hundred thousand bucks. So crossover, two-door sports car, I'm, uh, I'm kind of in either way. Chevy Way Corvette and Chevy wants to go with this one. And to put kind of a really fine point on this, when you look at some of the exotics that Chevy sort of competes with. They do compete with this. The, to me, the, the C8, the Stingray, is as good a value in any segment as you can get, mm -hmm. you know, because it is an exotic mid engine sports car that you could get for like 50 some thousand bucks. I mean, that's a steal in so many different ways. You add, you know, the Altium technology, which is what it sounds like they're going to use, and you could even slice that up a few different ways, like make a more affordable one, like, you know, the Mach-E, you know, the entry level one, make it more powerful with more range, charge more money for it. Uh, you could do some interesting things. You know, again, that certainly lends itself to like a crossover silhouette as well. So, um, you know, this is also an area where General Motors is ahead of companies that with the Corvette, they do compete against, you know. You can suddenly throw out that Ultium battery pack against Ferrari and like, what are they going to say? They don't yeah. have any sort of EV tech that can answer that. Porsche does with the Taycan, but also remember they've got the Volkswagen group, you know, behind them, helping them with their battery technology. But it's, it's definitely not like a, you know, universal thing. Like this, this is definitely becoming a strength for Chevy and Ford. So, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, to me, that would be kind of wild if Chevy gets an electric Corvette out before Tesla gets the electric Roadster back, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, kind of wild. Yeah. I, I really think that no matter what, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's really looking like the Corvette lineup is going to be uh, way more diverse than it has ever been with, you know, mm -hmm. just your standard small block V8, the Z06 with a flat plane crank V8 a hybrid, an EV. Uh, it's going to start looking like the 911 lineup, honestly, with like 8 billion different variations. I'm sure that they'll have convertible and coupe versions of both. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be a million different choices, which is great. I'm all for it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Cool. So let's uh, transition to something that I've been enjoying a lot this year. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Formula One. Yes. We, uh, Recently got word that Audi and Porsche, two Volkswagen Group brands, are looking to enter the series in about a couple of years. Um, this has been rumored for years that one or both would try to get in there. Makes a ton of sense, especially for uh, 
you know, these brands are enthusiast oriented brands for many of their products to try to get in there and, you know, get sort of that enthusiast message to some of their core consumers. And um, I think it could be a good move for both of them. I'm a little surprised that VW is sort of looking at both of them from a strategic standpoint. Like it seems like from a corporate hierarchy standpoint, you could probably pick one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go yeah. from there. Audi had, you know, the, the like the best endurance team of all time, you know, in the early 2000s into the 2010s. Like they just, like Tom Christensen and those guys, I mean, they would just dominate at Le Mans and like here in like the ALMS series when it was called that. Um, so, I mean, and they both, obviously Porsche, have great motorsports histories. Uh, but Formula One is something different and it's not cheap. I mean, one of the stories is it looks like Audi would make a like $550 million like offer to sort of buy into McLaren, which is an interesting move. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we'll see. But I mean, at a high level, I would love to see two of these brands involved in Formula One. Me too. Me too. I mean, to have, you know, some, some sort of team McLaren Audi, that sounds mm -hmm. pretty cool. I was pretty excited when Honda swooped in and they were, uh, Honda McLaren, then obviously mm -hmm. that went very downhill. But yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the partnership, I think, with with Porsche, I, I know that they're they're rumored right now to be talking with Red Bull to possibly supply engines uh, when they get to the uh, the engine refresh in 2026, uh, which is an even cooler partnership than I feel the uh, possible McLaren Audi one, since this will be a true engineering partnership. Uh, you know, if, if Porsche hops back in there and starts to develop F1 engines, I'm going to be very, very excited about that. I know that, you know, way back in the eighties, they had a lot of success. Uh, Porsche has not spent a lot of time in F1, you know, back then they were sort of Porsche tag engines. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, no, if, if, if they get back in here, uh, seeing how successful Porsche has pretty much been in every motorsports competition that they try to compete in, I have a feeling that they're going to be very, very good. Will they be world beaters right at the start? I'm, I'm not so sure. You know, I was, I was feeling pretty good about Honda's chances when they jumped right back into the sport a few years back. But obviously, you know, any sort of predictions about success for them right away were very, very wrong. They eventually got there. They obviously won the world championship with with Red Bull last year, but uh, just in time for them to pull out. So I don't know. I don't know if, if Porsche can hop right back on there and be super competitive in F1 as it is today, um, or, or if it'll take them some time and, uh, you know, maybe five, six years down the road of them, maybe by like 2030, we'll see a Porsche winning a world championship. That would be really, really cool. I think that's a really good approach for Porsche too. I agree with you. Like, you know, it, Audi sounds like they're going to be more ambitious, like just reading all the different scuttlebutt out there from like car and auto week and a few other like really hardcore motorsports like pubs. Like, yeah, it's a little like that seems very ambitious. Like they're trying to go very much into the McLaren team, which I mean, I know McLaren's had some financial troubles, but to me, I mean, you're talking about one of the most successful teams of all time. So is somebody who likes the sport, like I kind of prefer the idea of like Audi being something a little bit different, not taking over McLaren, you know, <laughs> but there's a lot of questions there yet to be um, answered. But a Porsche engine deal sounds awesome. Like Red Bull had a lot of success too with those uh, Renault engines yeah. for a while too. So getting like the right unit in their cars could, I mean, could really get them back up on the grid. Yeah, I know that, you know, they, they've basically taken over the Honda powertrains for right now and are just doing all of all the development work themselves, um, you know, and it, it seems to be working. You know, they're pretty much just as quick as Ferrari this year for the most part. They've uh, pretty much won a, an equal amount of races. And like you said, it's been super, super fun to watch so far this year. So I don't know, man, I'm, I, I'm really excited. There's obviously every chance that they could uh, go back on this because they won't actually be entering for real, for real, for, for a few yeah. years now. But uh, man, I am very excited about the prospects of it happening. I've been just real quick trying to like really pin down the, 
to go back to the Audi side of things. They're, it looks like they're offering 650 million euros for a pretty large stake in the McLaren team. So I was looking for that number now for a few minutes. Yeah, and yeah. That's a power play. Right? <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. And yeah, they, I mean, if they do that, they will be like the McLaren Audi F1 team. So they'll for sure have have their name out there right next to McLaren, and yeah. I, don't, I mean it, it, they haven't defined how that would work. You know, would there be Audi people in the garage? I don't know how much sway each would have, um, but uh, I mean maybe there'd be some 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 parts that Porsche develops that Audi gets to share because Volkswagen Auto Group. It uh, I don't know, or maybe they'll just be entirely separate like racing teams tend to do a lot and just sort of go their own ways. So, I yeah. don't know. So, so many questions I have right now. And uh, Herbert Dees has not exactly answered all of them. He's just sort of announced that it's happening. <laughs> Pretty excited for the Miami race this weekend, though. Um, you know, yet another U.S. race. So, I think that's awesome. New race, new track. Uh, man, I would I would love to be there. Um, oh, yeah. I, I'm actually considering the... Uh, the Austin race maybe this year or maybe Vegas the year after that. There's so many mm -hmm. opportunities now to go to a race in the U S and I, I, I love it. I would love for them to get back to Detroit. Let's have another Detroit Grand Prix. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think it could work on Belle Isle, although that's a pretty tight course, you know, where they're going to run the Indy cars yeah. and then Indy, Indy is actually going to switch to the streets of Detroit, which is where formula one ran in like the 1980s. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it could work. I think, you know, Detroit, I mean, obviously there's a lot of motorsports fans here, a um, lot of gearheads. I, I mean, a lot of people like F1 around here, that's for sure. And I mean, we got the air, we have the airports, we have the uh, hotels. I mean, I think it could totally work here. I agree. I mean, I'll give myself a plug. I wrote a column on this a few, about a month ago. Uh, mainly because I've been semi-addicted to drive to survive. I think that's really good, like, you know, evening content, if you will, when you're looking for something to do and maybe the, you know, whatever you normally want to see isn't necessarily on. It's just great. Open a beer and zone out from 9.30 to 10.30 at night or something on Netflix. Hey, I, I'm right there with you. I just finished the last season myself. Nice. And, uh, yeah, they... They do an interesting job, you know, every now and then maybe the drama is ramped up a little more than what reality actually is out there. But yeah. just like you said, it's 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 such a, an entertaining watch. And you know what, if, if they don't ultimately, you know, come super close to us, I would take uh, like Watkins Glen as like a consolation. Yeah. Do like a, yeah. a, a historical track. That would make me really excited. And I'm sure any old time F1 fans would would flock there in in the u.s at least gosh that would be like would that not be like the greatest email to get from like uh, a manufacturer saying hey we're going to be having some media we'd love to have you experience our something something uh it's gonna be at the f1 race at watkins Glen. Oh, i mean man. oh man i've never been there so that's like really on my list of tracks i'd love to get to you know do a lap or two in That'd be awesome. Yeah, same. I've I've driven past it a couple times, uh, hiking the the actual gorges of of the Glen. It's a beautiful nice. area down there, but yeah, I know. Got to get to that track one day. <laughs> Lime Rock too. When you look at those like northeast tracks, yeah. That, uh, have you ever been to Lime Rock? Never been. No, nope. that's okay. another one on the yeah. list. So well, we um, I feel like we're coming up with like a summer bucket list here of tracks we need to get to. No uh, kidding. Got to make a little northeast road trip. The fun car. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a, this is another fun one. Land Rover 30th anniversary edition. It, it essentially has some styling cues that hark back to the original uh, Defender that was sold here uh, 30 years ago. And I mean, that's just kind of what this is. They, um, they're kind of giving us, it's all, sort of like the Toyota Land Cruiser final edition. Um, 500 units for the American market. Uh, it harks back again to that first Defender from 1993. This is a 2023 model. Um, you know, the only thing I don't really like is the mud flaps. Otherwise, it's just <laughs> kind of a, a fun styling exercise that um, is pretty cool. You know, if I were looking for a Defender, I, uh, I'm i always a fan of steel wheels on off-roaders so, or trucks even. So, I, 
think this looks pretty awesome. Yeah, me too. Honestly, it, it looks like a pretty ideal spec with the, the white paint on the white painted steel wheels, all-terrain tires. The only thing that I might change about it is uh, upgrade from the 2-liter 4-cylinder up to the inline 6. Uh, that's that's the only version of, of the Defender that I've driven is the inline 6. Uh, that is such a smooth, smooth, nice powertrain with with all of the power that you might need in in a car like this. And at the starting price, looks like it's $75,000. Uh, I think I might just want an inline six versus a little turbo four. It might just make me a little happier, I think. But other 100%. than that, really, really great spec. <laughs> when I saw that, I thought, oh, they're, this is the turbo four is the motor they're going with? Ugh, okay. Yeah. And not that there's anything wrong with like that engine, but I'm just like, I don't know. It wouldn't be the vibe I would be looking for in that. Yeah, the the old one, you know, the the one that they're sort of basing this off of had a 3.9 liter V8 uh, with like at least a little rumbly sound. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I I don't necessarily want the uh, V8 Defender, but that that inline right. six I think would would be perfect. You know, we've seen a few cool like sort of throwback Broncos and Defenders and things like that, Wranglers in the last like just couple years. Now that these vehicles have all been back out on the market. The Wrangler, of course, has been a lot around, never left. But I mean, that park service or forest service uh, Bronco that they did with, uh, I think it was with Filson, which is kind of like a clothing utility goods brand. That was a really cool one. Um, and I think Ford did one with one of the, uh, the charity soup kitchens in Detroit around here. And that was like an all white one that looked really cool. Also had the steel wheels. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a cool look. You know, I think when you, when I'm looking at these vehicles, I don't want like the most cutting edge futuristic look. Like I, I kind of want that retro look. So yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Same. I actually saw that Filson Bronco, uh, it's like two years ago now, now when I was on the Bronco Sport launch, they had it oh, out nice. there at the off-road course. Yeah, thing looks fantastic. Would love to buy like that exact spec for the street. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would be cool if you could do this. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you can. Maybe if you play around in the configurator enough, you can make whatever Land Rover Defender look just like this one, or at least very close to it. I know that this is this is definitely the direction that I would take. Maybe a 90, though make it a two door and it'd be perfect. Yeah. I think the Defender in two doors looks to me that's the look. And I know that's kind of a cliched take, but I actually think in terms of the Bronco and the the Wrangler, it looks great with four doors. You know, I think I really think that's a good look for both of those and of course the Forerunner, but you know, to me when I see like the Defender with four doors, it takes on almost more of a generic SUV look. Whereas with two doors, I look at that and I think, okay, I see what they were going for. That reminds me of some like the concept they showed like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like they're kind of hitting a little closer to the mark there. And I mean, sometimes I wonder, not to get too like in the weeds on the design, but you see like that Ineos Grenadier uh, oh, yeah. thing. Saying that. And you kind of wonder, it seems like there's like a market that maybe Land Rover didn't quite capture with this new generation. Yeah, you know? it's, a, it's a really great point about it, you know, looking a lot like just a regular old SUV and four-door spec because you know, it looks a little like a Discovery when uh, you yeah. have a full long four-door Defender. They're going to have a three-row here. I think the, the, the 130, that's probably going to look even more plain Jane. So yeah. standing out with with the ninety, I'm hundred percent with you right there. That makes all all the difference in the world for that thing. All right. Well, we were talking about how we're not thrilled with the turbo in the uh, uh, previously. The turbo in the Kia Soul is going away, uh, and that is one of the highlights of the model year updates for the Kia Soul. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that's a good thing in this case, whereas, no. <laughs> you know, the, the Defender Turbo, like, I don't know if that's what we, either of us wanted, but no Turbo in the Soul? Seems like it's going to kind of be soul-sucking, if you will, to be <laughs> very cliched. That's so bad, I know. But you do get more standard safety features. Um, yeah, I don't know. The Kia Soul won our uh, compact crossover comparison a couple of years ago now. Uh, largely because we all love that turbo engine and the design and all-wheel drive and 
it it was one of those things where sort of the strengths outweighed the fact that it wasn't exactly a crossover and people just gave it a lot of points. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean that just like you said, that engine is 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 going to be missed. Uh, Two hundred one horsepower turbo engine from that. I uh, actually just uh, drove a car, the Kia Forte GT, that had that same engine with the same dual clutch transmission. That is just a great little powertrain. And uh, now that the only powertrain is a a two liter naturally aspirated four cylinder with a CVT uh, front wheel drive only, it's uh, yeah, it's just it's not going to be as as much fun. It's going to be, you know, it still looks great. I, I I do like what they they did to the front end. I like the new colors. That's one really cool thing with this update is that they, they added a, a couple of really interesting colors, like the 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 blue that they revealed it in is is fantastic. Um, and then I saw they also dropped the X line model, which was also sort of like a, a faux off road trim uh, that added a bunch of cladding and whatnot. Uh, the Soul was never really that kind of a vehicle, uh, but uh, you know, so that's that's fine that they dropped that. But um, yeah, really, really, what you said there, the Soul of of the Soul is is definitely gone a little missing here without that GT line trim with with the turbocharged engine. It's just, just not going to be as fun to drive because it was a, a legitimately fun, great car and super utilitarian. Still is is super utilitarian, but just not uh, not as enthusiast oriented as it used to be. I don't think. Yeah, I part of me wonders, like cynically, cryptically, are they? What's this mean for the soul? You know, like generally, when you're pulling engines out, scaling back model lineups, you start to question. Well, what's really the like? What's next for the soul? I mean, this is a refresh, so you know it is an update, and it does get more safety features. And, you know, arguably, I wonder how many consumers opted for that, you know, operated turbo engine. It's it's a little more enthusiast oriented. So I don't want to read too much into it. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's it's an interesting move for Kia. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, you know, if if you want that engine, there are other opportunities to get that engine in the Hyundai Kia lineup. So, yes. And probably, uh, you know, if, if you're into something sporty, maybe you'll go for a Kia Forte GT or a Hyundai Elantra N line that has that exact same powertrain uh, and is probably uh, more fun to drive than, than the Soul since it's more of a, that those cars are sedans and this one is it's technically a crossover with a much higher center of gravity. Definitely won't handle as well. So, Still sad about it, though. I can still be sad yeah. about it. <laughs> the Soul has always been about design, too. Yeah. You know, it's really like you buy it because it was kind of funky. I went on the launch back in, uh, well, I'm going to date myself here, 2009, and it was in Miami, and it was for Auto Week. And there was a rumor that Britney Spears was staying at the hotel. It was the Mandarin Oriental, which was a really nice hotel, especially in February, because I left here went down there and was like, well, this is great. These press trips are amazing. What is this? You just lay on the beach and then they had like a, a beach barbecue. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It was, a, you know, cool trip. But it also, you know, sometimes cars like that earlier in your career tend to stick with you. And I always have been like the soul has been on my radar as far as a vehicle that's like it's different at its best it can be kind of special it's funky um it was sort of the successor to like the honda element and the scion whichever the boxy scion was that, i forget that xb XB. XB, yeah, yeah. Uh, it filled that, that void you know the nissan juke was around for a bit but the soul is at staying power so you know i think the more they look at like the electrified version of it too that is where you're gonna and i drove that electrified version in Vegas a few years ago as well. To me, that's the future for the soul ultimately is give it some sort of electric lifeblood and let the design just stand on its own because it's it's a unique thing. That's that's actually what we were talking about in Slack this morning is, you know, Kia not giving us the electric soul. And yeah. that, man, it was like two or three years ago, Kia was saying, yeah, we're going to give you guys the electric soul. We're going to have that the electric Nero and the electric Kona are going to have all three of these options. And then they just sort of stopped talking about it. And eventually they confirmed that we were not going to get the electric sold. Um, I, I'm guessing they just think that there's not room for it in and amongst the Nero EV and the Kona electric. 
but uh, and they, they obviously still don't think that we we are deserving of it because even with this refresh, there's still no electric soul. Uh, maybe the next gen is is fully yeah. electric and there's no gasoline option at all. Um, and ideally, uh, it would also be pretty affordable, just like this this current soul, because that's it's definitely one of its its big benefits is that it is a relatively cheap little car. Um, so maybe that was the holdup is, is they, uh, they, they can't really get the price where they want it for the electric one right now. And maybe like five, six years down the road, then, then we can have a, an awesome electric soul for, I don't know, 25 grand. That sounds really great to me. Yeah, I agree with that. I'd agree with that. Uh, let's get some inside baseball here. New CEO at Aston Martin, Amadeo Felisa, who is not exactly a household name, but here's why you probably at least have a vague idea of who he is. He ran Ferrari from for the better part of a decade. Uh, he was the CEO, which was sort of the number two position when Luca de Montezimolo was the, the chairman, the commander in chief, like Luca was running the show of that place for years and years. But I mean, Felisa was a very important figure. You know, he ran like is my like take is like the day to day like of Ferrari for a really long time. And Ferrari has not really had a bad year, let's put it that way, or a real clunker of a product in a long time. You know, even with the F1 team kind of taking a decade off, <laughs> <laughs> um, they're back. They're back on top this year. So, I mean, Put simply, the dude knows what he's doing, and he's replacing Tobias Mowers, Mars, however you say it, who I did interview. I've interviewed him a few times, more when he was at AMG, but he seemed to be, my take, like Mercedes' guy, and Mercedes owns a chunk of Aston, and, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it resonated, like his message didn't seem to resonate with Aston, even though they have made some progress with some important product launches in the last few years. Uh, including things like the DBX and whatnot. But, I mean, to kind of bring this together, these are essentially two guys you may or may not have heard of. I'm just kind of wondering what this all means for Aston. You know, I mean, it's one of my, you know, like more enjoyable brands to cover, to write about. They have a great history. Um, I mean, how are you feeling when you look at like Aston, you know? taking their temperature. Yeah, it's it's really weird because I really thought that when they got Tobias Moores over there that he would really write the ship. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. they were they were sort of flailing, you know, a, a lot of their cars just weren't really that that competitive with with what was out there. They didn't have an SUV out. And now I feel like some of that ship is righted now and maybe it's 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 from Tobias or maybe it's not cuz he hasn't actually been there all that long. It's been maybe 2 years now. Uh, since he was CEO of of Aston Martin, um, and you know, I think that they're in a, a in a better place than before. They they've revealed some some really neat things. Uh, their mid engine supercar, that's sort of a four eight eight GTB competitor. Uh, the, the the Valkyrie is is a massive success and one of the the coolest hyper cars uh, that, that I've ever seen. I, I, I for one certainly think it's it's a lot cooler than the Mercedes AMG Project One out there, uh, mostly just because it has that V12 Cosworth engine that sounds incredible. Um, and then you know I haven't driven the DBX, but everybody that I know here has has absolutely loved it. Uh, they it, they consider it one of the best luxury performance crossovers out there. Uh, no money in in that conversation uh so you know some of their products i think are really cool interesting and good uh and all of their products look look extremely good uh they just you know somehow have to return to real profitability and making money on these cars uh you know uh, some some company like lamborghini or ferrari seem to be doing just fine and that name sort of sells it on its own but uh, I don't know. It just doesn't seem to be happening for Aston Martin, and maybe that's why Lawrence Stroll has has decided to switch it up and uh, go with an old Ferrari guy. <laughs> I mean, when you look at like Felice's resume, he ran Ferrari from '08 to '16, and before that, you know, he was at Ferrari for a long time and had some important roles within like the then Fiat Group. So 
if I'm him, you know, this is a guy you want to bring in when uh, you sort of take a look at the big picture. Um, their IPO went terrible, it sounds like, which is something that I sort of pride myself on looking at the industry like news. And I kind of missed that one. Uh, like, oh, geez, okay. So, I mean, in some ways, Aston's success was, you know, maybe five or six years ago when they were almost like, you know, they were private at that point. They had some pretty good launches with the sports car lines. You know, they were developing the DBX at that point. And, you know, they had a little bit more momentum going. And now it just seems like, you know, with the IPO, churning through CEOs. I mean, they've also, we were actually talking about this in Slack. Andy Palmer, who was like the the big dude at Infinity, kind of ran them for like a minute. Um, you know, They've been churning through people there, and that's, you know, not a great way to create stability and, you know, affect some sort of cohesive strategy. So Yeah, but hey, they have an F1 team, so they got that mm -hmm. going for them. <laughs> Aston Martin I is, mean, is an F1, and I wonder with, with the new CEO, will they, will they stay in F1 or not? That's, that's a question for the future, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things too where uh, F1 is so expensive. If I'm Aston Martin, it's, I mean, it's a great place to be if you're mm -hmm. Aston Martin. I mean, can they afford it? Honestly, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the thing, you know, and they're, they're really trying to get their name out there in sports cars and whatnot because they have that, that mid engine supercar coming and the Valkyrie. So it makes a certain amount of sense for them to want to try and make people think of them in that way. But yeah, like, like you're saying, F1 is so expensive and it makes sense for somebody who is as profitable as a, a company as Porsche is, but Aston Martin is not, not Porsche right now, not anywhere close. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So Porsche, Aston Martin, Maserati. Uh, this is the Levante Trofeo that uh, I've been driving for, I would call it like a long weekend, if you will. It, um, this is a 580 horsepower, uh, twin turbocharged Ferrari powered engine, uh, under the hood of this thing, all wheel drive, eight speed ZF, uh, automatic transmission, beautiful, beautiful crossover, $173,500, give or take. I'd add the custom red paint, which is a $17,000 option. Seven. So that's a lot wow. of numbers, but, um, I'm just really glad I didn't scratch it. Um, <laughs> hope you like that paint $17,000. Wow. <laughs> so it's part of there. And this is, I feel like this is the podcast where I'm just butchering like Italian words and British words and German words. <laughs> it's the Fiorisi Corse collection. So that's essentially like the custom collection, if you will. Um, and this is one of the options you could get. You can make your Maserati look like kind of crazy, almost like 80s themes. The Corsa collection is more like the historic themes if you want and that's where you get like this very traditional italian red is it worth 17 grand of course not but it's also <laughs> a maserati that's six figures so it's not going to be like a two thousand dollar you know red paint option on a camry either like of course it's going to be 17 grand <laughs> and i will say this it's a gorgeous color it's almost iridescent like when the sun hits it I was coming around the corner looking at it after walking the dog. I was like, that car looks like it's glowing almost, you know. It really did have that kind of just like transcendent appearance. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And like one of the things I, I put in my review that is being about to be published is if you want an Italian SUV in this segment, it's this or basically the Urus. You know, the Stelvio is a bit smaller and it's just, it's its own thing. You know, Ferrari doesn't have a crossover yet uh, or an SUV yet. So if, like, this is sort of what you're looking for. This is it. You know, people need crossovers. If you're like a Maserati buyer, this is something you're going to look at. It's kind of a, you know, qualified conclusion, but I don't think the market for this vehicle is particularly large. Um, I would probably go more likely like the X6M, the Cayenne Turbo Coupe. I think those are all better values. Some of them have more horsepower even, although this is a lot of horsepower. The X6M, 
um, you know, they're a little more, I'd say, holistic, if you will, as far as like uh, being like hot rod SUVs. That being said, and not to put too fine a point on this, I mean, it's a beautiful design. Like it's Italian front to back, you know, with that grill, the curved fenders, the different paints you can get on it. I mean, it does have a presence and your neighbor, no matter like whatever gated community you live in, where you're like, <laughs> you know, trying to beat the Joneses, your neighbor probably has a BMW or a Mercedes or something probably doesn't have a Maserati, you know? So I think there is still like, I would compare it a bit to the Jaguar F-Pace SVR I drove about a month ago, which is a much better deal than this. That car was um, starts at like 84 or five, I want to say, uh, for a similar, like, you know, high powered V8 experience only that was supercharged, which I liked a little bit better. Mm. Um, I would say the, the Maserati is a little bit better, probably not twice as much better though, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as like a base price. Um, but there is still like some Maserati mystique, some magic that does come along with driving this car, in my opinion. Uh, and I know you drove one a while back. So, um, you know, there, there's definitely some shortcomings here too. You know, there's some yeah. Stellantis, Fiat Chrysler bits, and not even the good ones, you know, like <laughs> it could definitely, like a Ram has a better infotainment screen, you know? Yeah. So there's yeah. some shortcomings, but I do think the Maserati magic can overcome that. I don't know if you agree with that, though. What do you think? My, I mean, my favorite thing about this car and its its main selling point for me is that engine. Uh, the fact yeah. that you can get, uh, I mean, this is a true Ferrari engine. This is no like Stelvio Quad with uh, like a V6 with or the V8 with two cylinders chopped off. No, this is this is a Ferrari engine that was, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, under the hood of. Uh, Ferrari badged vehicles, mm -hmm. um, and you know it feels like a uh, an exotic engine. It sounds like an exotic engine, uh, and like you said, it has has just a stupid amount of horsepower. Um, and that right there, you know, if if you're a, an Italian car enthusiast, if you're an engine enthusiast, some sort of like a, a really big engine nerd in that way, then I think that this car has has a lot of appeal, and certainly much more appeal than. Uh, say something like a Cayenne Turbo or a Cayenne GTS, um, or like you mentioned, an X6M. You could throw out GLE 63S out there too. Uh, you know, all those cars, they offer very similar experiences. Um, you know, they all handle extremely, extremely well. They all have 4-liter twin-turbo V8 engines, except for the BMW is a 4.4-liter. Uh, but they all, you know, they're all very similar. And I think that the Maserati is is a slightly different driving experience it sounds different uh it has has that italian feel to it um you know is it just like you were saying is it as holistically good as those other ones no i don't think that the interior is is really as a, a, a as nice as those the tech in it isn't quite as good and the price is significantly more uh so for all those reasons it's you know it, it's not exactly uh, like the go-to buy that we would recommend to anybody, but sort of like how I started off, if you are that, that kind of person who finds, you know, pure joy and, uh, such a genius and an, an incredible powertrain like that one, uh, you got to have a Ferrari engine under the hood. Cause I mean, you, you have the red crinkle paint and everything. Uh, it's, it's special. Um, and that right there is, is why you buy the, Levante and maybe why you buy the $17,000 red paint too. So it, it has, has its points. Uh, but I, it's, it's for a very specific buyer, I think. Trident points. Let's put it Trident that way. Trident points. A good one. <laughs> they actually messed, not messed, changed the, some of the script font, which I was kind of, um, looking closely at. I can't tell the difference in the word Maserati. But in this car, it does say Trofeo right above the like the the vents on the front. Oh fenders, yeah, yeah, which is cool. That's a nice little detail. Um, they they, they kind of needed that because the the one that I drove two or three years ago didn't say Trofeo on it anywhere. 
There's oh, literally geez. just the, the, the trident on the, the, the rearmost pillar. And that was the only thing that sort of designated it as, as a trofeo. And half the reason like you buy one of these things is so that you can brag to your neighbors that you bought the most expensive one, right? That's why yeah. every AMG has 30 AMG badges on it. Same with the M cars. Everybody's got to know. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good that they added that trofeo on the, on the front fender there. <laughs> That's where I actually, I think I was looking at this guy who lives around the corner for me as a model three. And I was thinking, gosh, I really like that Tesla. I think it's my favorite one actually. And like they don't even there there's hardly any badges on Teslas. And I feel like that's where like you know a, a brand is getting it right for their image when they don't have to like, you know, beat you over the head with their different like explanations about what engine you got, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, logos are certainly iconic from the Yankees crest to the Maserati crest to the old English D. I mean, they're they can be very iconic. And I think for Maserati it works. Um I, honestly, I don't think it works as well for some of the different like AMG and M cars where it's like, okay, yeah, I mean, geez, we get it. You have an M5. Cool, man. Like, you know, uh, and one thing cl that's clear about the Trofeo though is the sound is awesome. Yeah. I mean, that bass reverberates like through your neighborhood. Um, it gets a lot of attention. Let's put it that way. And, uh, you know, I took it up to... Uh, by Stellantis headquarters, just because one of the great things about living in Metro Detroit is usually there's a car location that you can tie to the thing you're reviewing somewhat nearby. So I drove up there. Um, I drove kind of near. There's actually a Maserati headquarters, like in the old Walter Chrysler Museum. Uh, I didn't actually go to it, but I kind of looped by it, if you will, and ended up at the Meadowbrook Mansion, uh, which oh. is on the grounds of Oakland University. And uh, just a good place to hang out with some of the sort of the Maserati, like family tree, if you will, you know? Yeah. Seems like a nice place for it. I, 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 if I recall correctly, it's very pretty up there. So it's a great setting for that car where somebody who, uh, who has a few dollars might go out and spend, spend a day or two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, shifting gears here to something that's far more ubiquitous or Hyundai hopes it will be. That's the Ionic five, uh, Interested to hear your take. We've had a few people on the show who have been getting through it recently. Uh, I drove it last fall, but the floor is yours. Yeah, man, Ionic 5. So this was my first go at any of the Hyundai Group eGMP cars. Uh, I haven't been in the, the Kia EV6 yet, um, but uh, Ionic 5 was honestly the one that I think I was most excited about, mostly because I, I prefer its looks over the EV6. Uh, a really big hatchback. Granted, it's sort of like a, a mega super large hatchback. Once you see it in, in your driveway there, it is much larger than say like a GTI uh, or like a Civic hatchback. Um, but uh, yeah, like first impressions, look at the thing. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, I love all of the retro design touches to it. The lights, the little pixel lights feel very of, of the moment. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, Every little like weird little touch there, you know, you can tell that there's a lot of a lot of detail put into this this car's design to make it cool and interesting. Um, and then you hop into it, and it's unlike any Hyundai I've ever uh, seen on the inside. This thing uh, costs just over fifty seven thousand uh, dollars. So with that, you sort of expect a fifty seven thousand dollar interior. And I honestly thought that it, it, it delivered for the most part. Um, mine was in this uh, two-tone green and white interior, uh, which, green. yeah, <laughs> which, which I really liked. It was, it was a nice compliment to the uh, sort of teal exterior color as well. Um, but uh, no, you, you hop in there. There's no Hyundai logo on, on the steering wheel to sort of tie back to our logo talk. Um, and you know you you're met with these you know pretty large wide swath of screens, great materials everywhere, um, and all of the little little detailing I think continues. You know you have like cool little pixel graphics on the doors. Uh, I was just like loving being in this thing. It's so spacious. Uh, you know there's no like center tunnel for you to knock your knee against. Uh, it's just really really refreshing and different. Um, and I really like driving the thing too. 
Uh, so it's sort of like hitting all three, one exterior design, interior design, driving, um, you know, it's, it's quick. It's, it's not, uh, like make your stomach hurt quick, which, which I'm totally fine with. The one that I drove was, was the dual motor, uh, 320 horsepower, 446 pound feet of torque. Um, and I thought it handled pretty well too, for what it is, you know, it, it certainly feels, uh, a bit weighty. Um, and it, it can be a little ponderous when you, uh, really start swinging it around. If you try and treat it like a, like a GTI or some other hot hatch, it's not exactly that. It's still, uh, very much a daily driver and comfortable car at heart. Um, and honestly, I think that Hyundai nailed it, uh, by sort of straddling that being, all right. So it's, it's sort of fun to drive because it's, it's rear drive bias. You can swing the tail around a little, has that super low center of gravity. So it feels very stable but it's not this sort of like super buttoned down hot hatch. Um, and I think that the Ionic N will be that, you know, very sporty version of this thing that a lot of people will be wanting. I know that I will definitely be looking forward to that car after driving this one at another hundred horsepower, stiffer suspension, whole lot of cool, uh, and exterior changes. And man, this thing is going to be a lot of fun. You know, I, I even charged the thing too. I, I, I hooked up to an, an Electrify America station, one of the 350 kilowatt uh, power ones. And I was at 39% uh, when I plugged in. And about 16 minutes later, I was at 84%, which was wicked quick. Honestly, that this is the fastest charging EV I've ever driven. I've yet to drive the Taycan. I know that that would just about match it or even do better than it. Um, but, uh, no, I was very impressed with, with the car's performance charging. Uh, and you know, you even have the little, uh, fully, fully recline and footrest that you can do with the Ionic five. So I fully reclined the seat, kicked the footrest up and I just sort of laid there and relaxed for about 15 minutes while I waited for it to charge. Uh, you know, maybe more EVs need a full layout feature with, with the footrest to let you hang out there while you charge. So yeah. yeah. Overall, love this thing. What do you think about it? <laughs> so I, it's one of the vehicles I am very excited to drive this year. You know, every year you kind of sketch out like what car, what, what are you really excited to get into? And for me, you know, it's like the Bronco, the Maverick. One year it was a McLaren, which was a pretty cool year. But like this is on the short list uh, to get back into. Uh, so uh, very excited about just what it means for Hyundai and what it means for like just the electric car segment in general. I like how it looks. Um, originally, I liked the EV6 better. Uh, I just thought it was a better pure like design from a, like a stylistic standpoint. Uh, this one is growing on me, seeing it in real life. It's John Snyder and I were talking about this, how it has kind of like an 80s, almost like, you know, kind of like quattro sort of vibe with those headlights. And like, I like that. That's obviously a cool era of design. You kind of got to really want to see that if you look at it, but it does look cool. Um, and I think Hyundai did a good, good thing here by taking like a measured approach to it. Like you're going to be able to get the end version with more horsepower and that'll be a little more of the sportier thing. It'll be more expensive. Like the specs on this are good, but they're not mind blowing. You know, you're not going to buy this because it one ups anybody else but it's a good value. It looks good. To me, it sort of embodies everything Hyundai has been doing recently, which is take a step forward in design like they did with the Palisade, uh, do something a little bit different. Uh, there's not many cars in general that look like this out there, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, dial into the technology and go for it. You know, I was okay with the interior. I drove one that had more of a whitish gray beige thing. So, that was an area where I was kind of like, oh, geez, I don't know if this feels like 50 grand or whatever, but uh, I also don't recall exactly how that car was equipped either. It doesn't sound as like sporty as the green and white teal combo thing that you had going on, which, you know, like we said with the Trofeo, paint does make a difference. <laughs> you know, it could make something feel special. So uh, very optimistic about this car though, uh, crossover, if you will. I think it's... Um, I think it's going to do a lot for them if they can get the word out. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I, I missed seeing it go and, uh, you know, pretty much uh, there, there are very few, few complaints that I have about this. I just want to try out the EV6 now to see what I think about 
you know, which one of these should you buy? Because that's the, that's sort of the question here. They're so similar in that, you know, the, the, the big difference is, is really just final tuning and design. So, yeah, but both both really great cars. All right. Sounds good. All right. So we are going to debut a new segment on the podcast. Uh, senior editor for All Things Green, John Snyder, is on the ground in San Antonio, Texas, for the first drive of the 2022 Ford F-150 Lightning. Uh, it's kind of an interesting segment here where he's going to tell us what it's like to be there. Uh, it's just his general uh, take on things. So, um, granted, he, you know, is there and enjoying, like, you know, the trip. So, let's hear from John. Thanks, Greg. I'm currently outside of San Antonio, Texas, and I'm sitting in the 2022 Ford F-150 Lightning. Specifically, I'm in the Platinum Trim Dual Motor Extended Range. It's got 580 horsepower and 775 pound-feet of torque. Uh, it's a beautiful truck, really nice two-tone leather seating. It's got Ford Blue Cruise hands-free driving, that giant infotainment screen, panoramic sunroof. It's got the shifter that flips down to give you a nice work surface. Um, this version of the car, the extended range, comes with the Charge Station Pro, which is neat. It's the charging station. Uh, it provides 19.2 uh, kilowatts into the car, but uh, should you need it, it can take up to 9.6 kilowatt kilowatts out of the car to put it into your house should you lose power. Um, for this, you need the home integration system that converts it from DC from the truck to AC for your home, but it can provide up to uh, three days of power uh, from the truck. Um, if you are really conserving energy, Ford says you can power your home for up to 10 days, which would really come in handy uh, in one of those dire outages. And speaking of charging, most charging happens at home, but there's a lot of tension surrounding public charging. Uh, Ford is working with its partners to create the Blue Oval Network, uh, 70,000 plus plugs, 20,000 plus sites. Uh, and it's trying to get these customers to build these sites where they're most useful to Ford customers. Um, the F-150 Lightning has a Power My Trip uh, feature in the app that helps you plan trips uh, with charging integrated into the trip, which is quite helpful. Uh, Tesla does something similar. Um, the Electrify America network, uh, the tr truck is uh, plug and charge capable, so you can plug it in and it does sort of electronic handshake and it knows how to bill you and you just plug it in and go. Um, Ford has deployed a fleet of vehicles to test chargers all over the U.S. just to make sure they're working properly in places where they're going to be needed to sort of establish trust with customers for whom, you know, this is might be their first EV, probably will, will be. Um, today, I'm just driving on some expressways, rural highways, in town a little bit. Tomorrow, I'm going to try some off-roading in the Lightning and some towing. Um, but I, so far, I am really enjoying some of this truck's features. The Blue Cruise hands-free driving um, is, is really neat. It's got a little camera that monitors your driving. Um, unless you take your hands off the wheel in certain instances. Uh, it's got sport, off-road, and tow haul modes, which is great. It's got a one-pedal driving mode, which I think all EVs should have. I don't know why some uh, EV companies don't uh, include that, but, you know, the F-150 Lightning does. So thank you, Ford, for one-pedal driving. Um, some other great features. It's got a huge trunk with power inside. Ford was telling us about a, a customer, a disabled vet who had a mobility scooter. Um, he was super excited that his mobility scooter fit in the trunk of this truck and he could charge it while driving. So he had, you know, more, uh, charge in his scooter to interact with his kids and chase them around and spend more quality time with them. Um, the truck comes with a 240 volt, 30 amp mobile charger. So level two uh, charging right out of the box. Um, but with an adapter, you can plug that into the bed of the truck and you can charge any other EV that might need some power. Say a friend runs out of juice on the highway, you can show up in your lightning to the rescue. Um, and it can also power tools out in the field, of course, and there's lots of exterior lighting to you know light 
your sort of workspace zone. Um, as we know, that this is already a wildly popular truck, already sold out for 2022. Ford is expanding production capacity to 150,000 units, which will represent about a third of F-150 sales, which is kind of mind-blowing. Um, yeah, I'm excited to tell you more about how the truck actually drives, but that's going to have to wait until my review publishes on Wednesday. Thanks. Back to you, Greg. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, safe travels home. Uh, now it's time to go to the mailbag. Should we, uh, you're ready to answer some questions and spend some money? I think so. Let's check okay. it out. Let's do it. Uh, this is really more of a question, if you will. Um, Josh from New Hampshire writes, great podcast. I listen every week. Thank you, Josh. Glad to hear that. Question is specifically about the new MDX, but unfortunately applies to most new vehicles. My wife and I recently test drove the MDX. We're irritated with the touchpad interface. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that one. I already one. know where this one is going. <laughs> yeah, it could be even off the rails. Um but I'll, to get through some of this here, I've watched and read a bunch of reviews on it. With rare exception, uh, they all are complaining about it in the same way. The best I've heard was, I think it was from someone at Autoblog, he adds, is that after it takes you a few weeks, you get used to it, and it's not so bad. That could have been me, although that sounds pretty warm for how I've been feeling about it. That could be maybe more like like you, no, that Zach. Was, that was 100% Joel. me. 100% okay. me. <laughs> Yeah, so so there's some challenges there. Um, basically, what he's asking is asking someone to buy something with the promise that it will suck at first, but probably get better seems like a big ask. I'm not disagreeing with you, Josh. First question, how hard is this for Acura to fix it? Um, second question, will automakers in general listen to the overwhelming number of reviewers and buyers who don't like these complicated uh, infotainment interfaces and just go back to knobs and buttons. Uh, he notes accurately that a lot of the trucks and off-roaders have basically stayed the course with knobs and buttons to keep things simple. So a uh, couple questions here. Um, I don't actually know if Acura is looking at any near-term fixes. Perhaps you do, Zach, but I don't, I think this is their infotainment for the near term. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want my personal take, I don't think it's broken. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm I one of the few on staff who actually likes the Acura True Touch infotainment system. And I am the one who, who wrote, you know, if, if you use it for, for a few weeks, you will learn to like it. Uh, it ends up being uh, quicker and easier to use than a lot of other infotainment systems that don't have that True Touch technology. Uh, granted, it's a great point, and I, I completely see this point that uh, it's not exactly a great idea uh, to try and sell somebody on a car that they have to get used to. Uh, that, that could create a lot of problems in the test drive, which is a very important part of any purchasing, purchase, of any purchasing decision. Uh, if you cannot figure it out, I could see it's very likely that you might just walk away from the car frustrated. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, that's... You just kind of got to spend some more time with it, and then maybe you won't think it's broken anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if you're looking at the MDX and you don't like it, I mean, I guess it's kind of up to you if this is how, frankly, you want to spend your money. Is it a deal breaker or, you know, try to live with it, you know, uh, try to live with it, I would say, see if maybe the dealer will let you have an extended test drive or something, you know, I don't. Dealers are more flexible these days. That could be one solution. It's just say, hey, look, I, I love this thing, but I don't know about the infotainment. Like, I'm a maybe. Give me the crossover for a week and I might buy it. Um, or if you can't do something like that or similar, I'm going to go see what's going on with like an X3 or an X5 or something, you know? I mean, uh, because I don't know. I mean, it's I did slowly come to understand it grudgingly. Um, and it's like, I get what they're doing and it's an okay interface as far as <clears throat> from like a design aesthetic and what they're trying to do. But I don't know. I just, to me, it's like one of those things too, even once I did start to understand it, like in a version of this is it was in our long-term TLX A spec, like I understood it and I didn't like it, you know? Uh, so that's, to me, that's a hurdle. Yeah. 
So yeah, and the the question is how hard is it for Acura to fix it? Uh, extremely. Uh, it's pretty it, hard. It's it's not going to change because yeah, yeah the, the actual screen itself is so far up in the IP uh, uh, up there on the dash. Uh, there's not going to be any like change to a touch screen at, at like a midlife refresh or something like that. Uh, they're pretty much stuck in that pad operation for the foreseeable future. Cause that's not something that they like change after a year or two, pretty much every Acura is going to be in this, the same boat for a good while now. So if you don't like it, well, maybe the Acura is, is not the car for you then. So that's the first question. Second question here is just in general, are OEMs going to listen to um, like complaints and go back to knobs and buttons? I think we, we have seen a little bit of kind of a, like a, a coming back to where companies that were going, I think Cadillac's a great example with Q, where like it had like electronic buttons that were very hard to use, especially on cold days. You know, they've brought back more of a middle ground infotainment system. Uh, I think it's a little bit of common sense too. Like even like the Uconnect system on Stellantis vehicles, which is a big screen, there's still a few like very basic sort of pillar functions you can do. Uh, so I think that's really the path forward. And then you just kind of, you know, it's in the case of infotainment, it's very hard to like speak in broad terms because every company does have a different approach. And some are always going to invest in that like almost no button approach. And for some, it will work. You know, some companies do have really good touchscreens. Some probably aren't going to go down that road as much. Um, so it's it's going to really kind of come down to, do you like that car? And how well do you adapt to the infotainment? Yeah, I really think that the point about every automaker is going to basically go their own way. Like you, you see somebody like Volkswagen and they've gone like 100% into touch haptics, uh, weird, weird touch sliders, uh, and just full full touchscreen controls in cars like the ID4, the new GTI, uh, even the ID Buzz has stuff like that. Whereas uh, you know, if if you look at you know what what Ford is doing with with a lot of their cars, every F one fifty has a, a bunch of buttons and knobs galore. Same with Ram. Uh, you know, it, it, even though you still have that giant twelve inch screen in there, Ram still manages to find room to put redundant buttons and knobs for pretty much every important control in the car. So it, it's really just, you know, does an automaker think it's important or does the automaker not think it's important? And sometimes I, I think it sort of depends on the, the, the specific car mm -hmm. because just like his point there, a lot of the, the trucks and off-road focused vehicles uh, and even sports cars to a certain extent, like the new BRZ GR86, uh, you know, they understand that the, the buyers of those vehicles probably value uh, buttons and knobs more than say the buyer of some brand new EV like the Hyundai Ionic 5 that we were just chatting about. That thing has a lot of touch haptic controls and it's very screen and touch heavy with with a lot of things. So uh, and meanwhile you have the uh, you know other other Hyundai's out there that may not have as many touch controls on them. So automaker dependent, even model dependent on you know where they think the sort of buyer is 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 going to be for those those touch controls but yeah i don't see it uh changing a whole lot you know people are going to touch screens and those those sorts of controls we will continue to see more and some will sort of hold on back it's also i think important to note that it, it really does lie in the execution the devil really is in the yeah. details you know if you look at the id4 where it's a touch screen and I, I don't know if there's really any buttons. It's very, it can be tricky to use. Not terrible, but it's, it's not my favorite system out there. You look at a competitor like the Mach-E, which does have a few buttons, but it's also very heavily, uh, you know, it's like the latest version of, of Sync. It's a heavy touch screen, uh, you know, oriented infotainment system, very easy to use. So a lot of it depends on how dense is the system, how well do those haptic buttons work? Do you just maybe salt and pepper in one or two buttons just so it's like the user can navigate like intuitively? Like just the little things can make all the difference, you know? So. I, yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. 
even just like a volume knob or like a home button sometimes yes. can make a huge difference in the experience. Acura's downfall, I think, is really that touchpad. Like people just don't like that's not what people use right now, you know, and I think that's tricky uh, to get educate consumers on how they need to use something. So, yeah. All right. So that is the mailbag. It's sort of a spend my money. We have an update on a spend my money from episode 704. Uh, let's see. We have, let me scroll on down here. Uh, this is from Earl. He sold his 2018 Tesla Model 3 for 40 grand and made about $2,000. Hey, thanks inflation. Thanks used car market. Glad that worked out for you. So, uh, he did that and he had been looking at some different things, was looking at going back to just like, you know, an ice powered thing, like a beater, if you will, for a couple of years until he figured out what he wanted. He figured it out a little bit quicker, ended up with a Ford Maverick. Well, no, he was looking at a Ford Maverick, but he couldn't find any just because Ford is selling, you know, the doors off of those things. Found out the hybrid powertrain was shared with the Escape. So he bought a 2022 Ford Escape plug-in hybrid that covers his commute to work on electric. So um, he essentially kind of took his own advice. So thanks for writing, Earl, and thanks for the update. And uh, I think that's a pretty good move. That's a very practical move. Yeah. Just go get the Ford you could, that's out there that probably meets your needs as well as any as the Maverick would have uh, outside of the truck things. But people have different ideas for what they use trucks for. Uh, and I, I think the Escape, the plug-in hybrid, is a, a very solid crossover. I think that's a good move. Yeah. And you know, if you're really dead set on a Maverick one day, uh, he's probably going to struggle trying to buy a Maverick for the next year, maybe two years. Uh, so just enjoy your plug-in hybrid Escape. And then maybe a couple years down the road, if you still want a Maverick, then maybe you can get one. It doesn't have any markup on it uh, and get it exactly how you want it. So, but uh, yeah, for, for the time being... Uh, if you have a place to plug in, a plug-in hybrid sounds lovely and sounds like he can commute to work on on electric power, which is the ideal situation in a plug-in hybrid. So living good, I'd say. That's the move right there. Get a plug-in where you get a like a you know sort of certain amount of range and then plug in and then you know you're can use the hybrid tech for the rest of your driving needs. I think that's really smart right now. And plug-in hybrids are much readily available versus EVs. You know, everybody, it seems like, is like looking for EVs or other things, whereas the hybrids are just kind of like the, you know, the, the, the simple option, you know, the traditional option at this point. So uh, good move, man. I, I hope it works out for you. You have any spring beer recommendations, Zach? Spring beer recommendations. Yeah, well, what are you drinking these days? Man, I had my first Oberon probably... Uh, mm a couple weeks ago, which is sort of like a spring rite of passage here for, yeah. for Michigan. That's, uh, that's, that's one I, I've been drinking as of late. Uh, I, I hit up Holmes Brewery here, here not too long ago too. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if you've ever been there down in Ann Arbor, but, uh, no. man, they always do a lot of, a lot of interesting experimental stuff that I think is fun. Um, you know, if, if you're into sour IPAs, IPAs of any, of any sort at all. They have a lot of really interesting tasting stuff. Um, so yeah, Oberon, great all, all the time. Uh, if, if you're in Michigan, hit, hit homes up. I can almost guarantee that you're going to find something you like there. Sounds good. I've been drinking some Griffin Claw, Mr. Blue Sky. Mm, uh, hopefully we have that. more Mr. Blue Sky here in the weather. It's a nice spring summer beer. Good year round actually too, but you know, a little bit more of a you know, kind of fruity kick and it's it's a good beer. It goes with anything. Cooking out, burgers, whatever you want. Yeah, I really have to hit Griffin Claw up here and nab me some. That just like you said, perfect spring beer. <laughs> All right. Perfect spring beer to go with hopefully your perfect spring podcast. We hope that's us. If you enjoy the Autoblog podcast, please give us a five star rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get the show. We're basically everywhere. Send us your Spend My Money. That's podcast at autoblog.com. Spend My Money's mailbags. We'd love to answer your questions. Be safe out there, everybody, and we'll see you next week.